The return trip from Heathrow took more than an hour, thanks to some particularly strong turbulence and easterly wind over the Welsh hills. When Holly and Butler finally touched down on the grounds of Fowl Manor, the LEP were busy hauling their mind-wiping gear up the avenue under cover of night. Butler unclipped himself from the moon belt, leaning against the trunk of a silver birch. You okay? asked Holly. Fine, replied the bodyguard, massaging his chest. It's this Kevlar tissue. Handy if I get shot with a small caliber, but it's playing havoc on my breathing. Holly sheathed her mechanical wings. It's the quiet life for you from now on. Butler noticed an LEP pilot attempting to park his shuttle in the double garage, nudging the foul Bentley's bumper. Quiet life, he muttered, heading for the garage. I wish. Once Butler had finished terrorizing the pixie pilot, he made for the study. Artemis and Juliet were waiting for him. Juliet hugged her brother so tightly that the air was squeezed from his lungs. I'm okay, little sister. The fairies have fixed it that I will live to be well over a hundred. I'll still be around to keep an eye on you. Artemis was all business. How did you fare, Butler? Butler opened a wall safe behind an air conditioning vent. Pretty well. I got everything on the list. What about the custom job? Butler laid out six small vials on the bay's covered desk. My man in Limerick followed your instructions to the letter. In all his years in the trade, he's never done anything like this. They're in a special solution to stop corrosion. The layers are so fine that once they come into contact with the air, they begin to oxidize right away. So I suggest we don't insert them until the last possible moment. Excellent. In all probability, I am the only one who will need these. But just in case, we should all put them in. Butler held up the gold coin up to it by its leather cord. I copied your diary and fairy files onto a laser mini disc, then brushed on a layer of gold leaf. It won't stand up to close examination, I'm afraid, but molten gold would have destroyed the info on the disc. Artemis tied the cord around his neck. It'll have to do. Did you plant the false trails? Yes, I sent an email that has yet to be picked up, and I hired a few megabits on an internet storage site. I took the liberty of burying a time capsule in the maze. Artemis nodded. Good, I hadn't thought of that. Butler accepted the compliment, but he didn't believe it. Artemis thought of everything. Juliet spoke for the first time. You know, Artemis, maybe it would be better to let these memories go. Give the fairies some peace of mind. These memories are part of who I am, responded Artemis. He examined the vials on the table, selecting two. Now, everybody, it's time to put these in. I'm sure the people are eager to wipe our minds. Foley's technical crew set up shop in the conference room, laying out a complex assembly of electrodes and fiber optic cable. Each cable was connected to a plasma screen that converted brain waves to actual binary information. In layman's terms, Foley would be able to read the human's memories like a book and edit out what shouldn't be there. Possibly the most incredible part of the entire procedure was that the human brain itself would supply alternative memories to fill the blank spots. We could do the mind wipe with a field kit, explained Foley once the patients were assembled, but field kits are just for blanket wipes. They would erase everything that's happened over the past 16 months. That could have some serious implications for your emotional development, not to mention your IQ. So it's better that we use the lab kit and simply erase the memories that pertain to the people. Obviously, we'll have to erase completely the days you were spent in fairy com company. We can't take any chances there. Artemis and Butler and Juliet were seated around the table. Technical gnomes swabbed their temples with disinfectant. I've thought of something, said Butler. Don't tell me, interrupted the centaur. The age thing, right? Butler nodded. A lot of people know me as a 40-year-old man. You can't wipe them all. Way ahead of you, Butler. We're going to give your face a laser peel while you're unconscious. Get rid of some of that dead skin. We even brought a cosmetic surgeon to give you a forehead, a doer injection, just move without the wrinkles. Doer? Fat, explained the centaur. We take it from one area and inject it into another. Butler was not enthused by the idea. This fat doesn't come from my behind, does it? Foley shuffled uncomfortably. Well, it doesn't come from your behind. Explain. Research shows that out of all the fairy races, dwarves have the greatest longevity. There is a miner in Pole Dane who is allegedly over 2,000 years old. Haven't you ever heard the expression, smooth at the dwarf's bottom? Butler slapped away a technician who was attempting to attach an electrode patch to his head. Are you telling me 
That fat from a dwarf's backside is going to be injected into my head. Foley shrugged. Price of youth. There are pixies on the West Bank paying a fortune for doer treatments. Spoke, Butler spoke through gritted teeth. I am not a pixie. We've all brought some gel to color any hair you might decide to grow in the future, and some dye to cover the cell corruption on your chest, continued the centaur hurriedly. By the time you wake up, your exterior will look young again, even if your interior is old. Clever, said Artemis. I expected as much. Holly entered with mulch in tow. The dwarf was wearing cuffs and looking extremely sorry for himself. Is this really necessary? He whined. After all we've been through. My badge is on the line, retorted Holly. The commander said to come back with you or not at all. What do I what do I have to do? I donated the fat, didn't I? Butler rolled his eyes. Please no. Juliet giggled. <laughs> Don't worry, Dom. You won't remember a thing about it. Knock me out, quickly. Don't mention it, grumbled Mulch, attempting to rub his behind. Holly uncuffed the dwarf, but stayed within grabbing distance. He wanted to say goodbye, so here we are. She nudged Mulch with her shoulder. So say goodbye. Juliet winked. Bye, Smelly. So long, Stinger. Don't go chew the thing in any concrete walls. I don't find that kind of thing funny, said Mulch with a pained expression. Who knows? Maybe we'll see each other again. Mulch nodded at the technicians, busy firing up their hard drives. If we do, it's thanks to these people. It'll be for the first time. Butler knelt to the dwarf's level. You look after yourself, little friend. Stay clear of goblins. Mulch shuddered. Oh, you don't have to tell me. Commander Root's face appeared on a roll-down screen erected by an LEP officer. Maybe you two would like to get married, he barked. I don't know what all the emotion is about. In ten minutes, you people won't even remember the convict's name. We have the commander online, said a technician, a tad unnecessarily. Mulch stared at the button camera mounted on the screen. Julius, please. Do you realize that all of these humans owe me their lives? This is an emotional moment for them. Root's rosy complexion was exaggerated by poor reception. I couldn't care less about your touchy-feely moment. I'm here to make sure this wipe goes smoothly. If I know our friend Fowl, he's got a few tricks up his sleeve. Really, Commander, said Artemis, such suspicion is wounding. But the Irish teenager couldn't suppress a grin. Everybody knew that he would have hidden items to spark residual memories. It was up to the LEP to find them. Their final contest. Artemis stood and approached Mulch Diggums. Mulch, of all the fairy people, I will miss your services the most. We could have had such a future together. Mulch looked a touch teary. True, with your brains and my special talents. Not to mention your natural lack of morals, interjected Holly. No bank on the planet would be safe, said the dwarf. A missed opportunity. Artemis tried his best to look sincere. It was vital for the next step in the plan. Mulch, I know you risked your life betraying the Antonelli family, so I'd like to give you something. Mulch's imagination churned with visions of trust funds and offshore accounts. Oh, there's no need, really. Although it was incredibly brave and I was in mortal danger. Exactly, said Artemis, untying the gold medallion from around his neck. I know this isn't much, but it means a lot to me. I was going to keep it, but I realized that in a few minutes it will mean absolutely nothing. I would like you to have it. I think Hollywood, too. A little memento of our adventures. Gee, said Mulch, hefting the medallion. Half an ounce of gold. You really broke the bank there, Artemis. Artemis gripped the dwarf's hand. It's not always about the money, Mulch. Root was craning his neck, trying to see more. What's that? What is he given to the convict? Holly snatched the medallion, holding it up for the camera. Just a gold coin, Commander. I gave it to Artemis myself. Foley glanced at the small metal. Actually, this kills two stinkworms with one skewer. The medallion could have triggered some residual memories. Highly unlikely, but possible. And the other stinkworm? Mulch gets something to look at in prison. Root molded over for several moments. Okay, he can keep it. Now get that convict into the shuttle and let's get on with this. I've got a council meeting in ten minutes. Holly led Mulch out, and Artemis realized that he really was sorry to see the dwarf go. But more than that, he was sorry that the memory of their friendship could soon be gone forever. The technicians descended like flies on a carcass. 
In seconds, every human in the room had electrodes attached to temples and wrists. Each set of electrodes ran through a neural transformer and onto a plasma screen. Memories flickered on the screens. Foley studied the images. Way too early, he announced. Calibrate them to 16 months ago. Actually, make that about three years. I don't want Artemis planning his initial kidnap all over again. Bravo, Foley, said Artemis bitterly. I was hoping you might miss that. The centaur winked. That's not how I did it, miss. On the pull-down screen, Root's pixelated mouth stretched into a smile. <laughs> Tell him, Foley. I can't wait to see the human's face. Foley consulted a file on his handheld computer. We checked your email, and guess what? Do tell. We found a fairy file just waiting to be delivered. We also ran a search on the internet in general, and lo and behold, someone with your email address had rented some storage megabits. More fairy files. Artemis was unrepentant. I had to try. I'm sure you understand. Nothing else you want to tell us about? Artemis opened his eyes wide, the epitome of innocence. Nothing. You're too clever for me. Foley took a small laser disc from a toolbox, slided it into the drive of a networked computer on the table. Well, just in case, I'm going to donate a data charge in your computer system. The virus will leave your files unharmed, unless they pertain to the people. Not only that, but the virus will monitor your system for a further six months, just in case you've outwitted us somehow. And you're telling me all this because I won't remember it anyway. Foley did a little four-step, clapping his hands together. <laughs> exactly. Foley pushed through the door, dragging a metallic capsule behind her. Look what they've found buried in the grounds. She flipped the lid, pouring the capsule's contents on the Tungeon carpet. Several computer disks and hard copies of Artemis's diary fanned across the carpet. Foley examined a disk. Something else you forgot to mention? Artemis was not quite so cocky now. His lifelines to the past were being cut one by one. It slipped my mind. That's it, I suppose. There's nothing else. Artemis returned to his chair, folding his arms. And if I say yes, you'll believe me, I suppose. Root laughed so hard that it seemed the screen was shaking. <laughs> oh, yes, Artemis. We trust you completely. How could we not after all of you put the people through? If you don't mind, we'd like to ask you a few questions under the mesmer. And this time, you won't be wearing sunglasses. Sixteen months previously, Artemis had successfully deflected Holly's hypnotic gaze with mirrored sunglasses. It was the first time he had outwitted the fairies. It was not to be the last. Well then, get on with it. Captain Short, barked Root. You know what to do. Holly removed her helmet, massaging the tips of her ears to get the circulation going. I'm going to mesmerize you and ask a few questions. It's not the first time you've been under, so you know what the procedure is not painful. I advise you to relax. If you try to resist, it could cause memory loss or even brain damage. Artemis held up his palm. Wait a moment. A am I right in thinking that when I wake up again, this will all be over? Holly smiled. Yes, Artemis. This is goodbye. For the last time. Artemis's face was composed in spite of the emotions churning inside him. Well then, I have a few things to say. Root was curious in spite of himself. One minute, Fowl. Then nighty night. Very well. First, thank you. I have my family and friends around thanks to the people. I wish I didn't have to forget that. Holly laid a hand on his shoulder. It's better this way, Artemis, believe me. And second, I want you all to think back to the first time you met me. Remember that night? Holly shuddered. She remembered the cold individual who had attacked her by a magical hotspot in southern Ireland. Commander Root would never forget escaping an exploding tanker by the skin of his wings. And Foley's first encounter with Artemis had been via a recording of the negotiations for Holly's release. He had been a despicable creature. If you take away the memories and influences of the people, continued Artemis, I might become that person again. Is that what you really want? It was a chilling thought. Were the people responsible for Artemis' transformation? And were they be responsible for changing him back? Holly turned to the screen. Is it possible? Artemis has come a long way. Do we have the right to destroy all that progress? He's right, added Foley. I never thought I would say this, but I kind of like the new model. Root opened another computer window on the screen. The Psych Brotherhood did this probability report for us. They say the chances of a reversion are slim. Fowl will still have strong positive influences from his family and the butlers. The Psych Brotherhood? Objected Holly. Argon and his cronies? 
And when exactly did we start trusting those witch doctors? Root opened his mouth to yell, but thought better of it. Not something that happened every day. Holly, he said almost gently, the future of our culture is at stake here. The bottom line is that Artemis' future is not our problem. Holly's mouth was a grim slash. If that's true, then we're as bad as the mud men. The commander decided to revert to his usual mode of communication. Listen to me, Captain, he roared. Being in command means making tough decisions. Not being in command means shutting up and doing what you're told. Now mesmerize those humans before we lose the link. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. Holly stood directly in front of Artemis, careful to make eye contact. Goodbye, Holly. I won't see you again, though I'm sure you will see me. Just relax, Artemis. Deep breaths. When Holly spoke again, her voice was layered with bass and alto, the hypnotic layers of the mesmer. That was some job we did on Spiro, huh? Artemis smiled sleepily. Yeah, the last adventure. No more hurting people. How did you come up with these plans? Artemis's lids drooped. Natural ability, I suppose, handed down by generations of fowls. I bet you'd do anything to hang on to your fairy memories. Almost everything. So what did you do? Artemis smiled. I played a few little tricks. What kind of tricks? Pressed Holly. It's a secret I can't tell you. Holly added a few more layers to her voice. Tell me, Artemis. It'll be our secret. A vein pulsed in Artemis's temple. You won't tell? And you won't tell the fairies? Holly glanced guiltily at the screen. Root gestured her to continue. I won't tell. It'll be just between us. Butler hid a capsule in the maze. And? I sent myself an email, but I expect Foley to find that. It's to throw him off guard. Very clever. Is there anything else you don't expect him to find? Artemis smiled craftily. Butler buried a capsule in the grounds, and I hid a file on the internet storage site. Foley's data charge won't affect it. The provider will email me a reminder in six months. When I retrieve the data, it should trigger residual memories and possibly total recall. Anything else? No, the storage site is our last hope. If the centaur finds that, then the fairy world is lost to me forever. Root's image crackled on the screen. Okay, the uplink is breaking up. Knock him out and wipe him. Tape the whole process. I won't believe Artemis is out of the game until I see the footage. Commander, maybe I should ask the others a few questions. Negative, Captain. Fowl said it himself. The storage site was their last hope. Hook him up and run the program. The commander's image disappeared in waves of static. Yes, sir. Holly turned to the technical crew. You heard the fairy. Let's go. Sunup is in a couple hours. I want us below ground before that. The techies checked that the electrodes had strong contacts, then unwrapped three sets of sleep goggles. I'll do that, said Holly, taking the masks. She hooked the elastic over Juliet's ponytail. You know something, she said. Personal protection is a cold business. You have too much heart for it. Juliet nodded slowly. I'll try to hold on to that thought. Holly settled the eyepieces gently. I'll be keeping an eye on you. Juliet smiled. See you in my dreams. Holly pressed a small button on the sleep mask, and a combination of hypno-lights in the eyepieces and a sedative administered the seals knocked Juliet out in less than five seconds. Butler was next. The technical crew had added a length of elastic to the mask's strap so that it could encircle his shaven crown. Make sure Foley doesn't go crazy with that mind wiper, said the bodyguard. I don't want to wake up with four decades of nothing in my head. Don't worry, said Holly reassuringly. Foley generally knows what he's doing. Good. Remember, if the people ever do need help, I'm available. Holly pressed the button. I'll remember that, she whispered. Artemis was last in the line. In his mesmerized state, he seemed almost peaceful. For once, there was no thought lines wrinkling his brow. And if Holly hadn't known him, he could almost seem like a normal 13-year-old human. Holly turned to Foley. Are we sure about this? The centaur shrugged. What choice do we have, mortars or orders? Holly placed the mask over Artemis' eyes and pushed the button. Seconds later, the teenager slumped in his chair. Immediately, lines of gnomish text began to flash across the screen behind him. In the days of Frond, Gnomish had been written in spirals, 
but reading the spirals gave most fairies migraine. Commence deleting, ordered Foley, but keep a copy. Sometime when I have a few weeks off, I'm going to find out what makes this guy tick. Holly watched Artemis' life being written in green symbols on the screen. This doesn't feel right, she commented. If he found us once, he'll find us again, especially if he goes back to being the monster he was. Foley tapped commands into an ergon ergodynamic keyboard. Maybe, but next time we'll be ready. Holly sighed. It's a pity, because we are almost friends. The centaur snorted. <laughs> sure, like you can be friends with a viper. Holly suddenly shut her helmet visor, hiding her eyes. You're right, of course. We can never have been friends. It was circumstance that pushed us together. Nothing more. Foley patted her shoulder. That a girl. Keep your ears up. Where are you going? Tara, replied Holly. I'm going to fly. I need the fresh air. You don't have clearance for a flight, objected Foley. Root will have your badge. For what? said Holly, firing up her wings. I'm not supposed to be here, remember? And she was gone, flying in a lazy loop through the entrance hall. She cleared the main door with inches to spare, climbing quickly into the night sky. For a second, her slim frame was backlit by the full moon, and then she disappeared, vibrating out of the visible spectrum. Foley watched her go. Emotional creatures, elves. In some respects, they made the worst recon operatives. All decisions were made from the heart. But Root would never fire Holly, because policing was what she was born to do. And anyway, who else would save the people if Artemis Fowl ever found them again? Moch sat in the shuttle's holding booth, feeling extremely sorry for himself. He tried to sit on the bench without actually touching it with his tender behind. Not an easy task. Things did not look good, it had to be said. Even after all he had done for the LEP, they were going to lock him up for at least a decade, just for stealing a few measly bars of gold. And it didn't seem likely that he'd get an opportunity to escape. He was surrounded by steel and laser beams, and would remain so until the shuttle docked in Haven. After that, it was a quick jaunt to police plaza, a summary hearing, and off to a secure facility until his beard turned gray. Which it would, if he was forced to spend more than five years out of the tunnels. But there was hope. A tiny glimmer. Mulch forced himself to wait until all the technical staff had cleared their equipment from the shuttle. Then he casually opened his right hand, rubbing his temples with thumb and forefinger. What he actually was doing was reading the tiny note concealed in his palm, the one slipped to him by Artemis Fowl when they shook hands. I have not finished with you yet, Mulch Diggums. On your return, tell your lawyer to check the date on the original search warrant for your cave. When you are released, keep your nose clean for a couple of years. Then bring the medallion to me. Together we will be unstoppable. Your friend and benefactor, Artemis Fowl II. Mulch crumpled the note. He made a cylinder of his fingers and sucked the paper into his mouth. His dwarf molars quickly destroyed the evidence. Mulch breathed deeply through his nose. It wasn't time to pop the Skylanian rockworm wine cork just yet. A review of his case could take months, possibly years. But there was hope. The dwarf wrapped his fingers around Artemis' medallion. Together, they would be unstoppable. I have decided to keep a diary. In fact, I am surprised that the idea has never occurred to me before. An intellect such as mine should be documented so that future generations of fowls can take advantage of my brilliant ideas. Of course, I must be careful with such a document. As valuable as it would be to my descendants, it would be more valuable to the law enforcement agents who are forever trying to gather evidence against me. It is even more important that I keep this journal a secret from my father. He is not himself since his escape from Russia. He has become obsessed with nobility and heroism. Abstract concepts at best. As far as I know, nobility and heroism are not accepted by any of the world's major banks. The family's fortune is in my hands, and I will preserve it the way I always have, through ingenious plots. Most of those plots will be illegal. The best always are. Real profit lies in the shadowy areas beyond the law. I have decided, however, out of respect for my parents' values, to change my criteria for victim selection. It would seem better for the world's ecology if several global corporations went bankrupt, and so I have resolved to help them on their way. Not victimless crimes, but one where a few tears will be shed for the injured parties. This does not mean that I have become a weak, latter-day Robin Hood. Far from it. I intend to reap substantial benefits from my crimes. My father is not the only one to have changed. 
Butler has grown old almost overnight. His appearance is the same as ever, but he has slowed down considerably, no matter how he tries to hide it. But I will not replace him. He has been a loyal employee, and his expertise in matters of intelligence will be invaluable. Perhaps Juliet will accompany on when actual protection is needed, though she now claims that a life in personal protection is not for her. Next week, she travels to the United States to try out for a wrestling team. Apparently, she has chosen Jade Princess as her stage name. I can only hope that she fails the audition, though I doubt it. She is a butler after all. Of course, I have some ongoing ventures which I can work on without the aid of a bodyguard. In recent years, I have developed software to divert funds from various bank accounts to my own. This software will have to be upgraded to stay ahead of the computer crime squads. Version 2.0 should be online within six months. Then there's my talent for art forgery. In the past, I have favored the Impressionists, but now for some reason, I am drawn to more fantastical subject matter, such as the fairy creatures depicted by Arthur Rackham. But these projects must be suspended temporarily. For today, I discovered that I am a victim of a conspiracy. The day began strangely. When I awoke, I experienced an instant of weakness. For a single moment before I opened my eyes, I felt content, my drive to accumulate wealth forgotten. This has never happened before. Perhaps the mood was left over from some magical dream, or perhaps my father's newfound positive attitude is contagious. Whatever the cause, I must be careful to avoid such lapses in the future. With my father in his current frame of mind, this is no time to lose my resolve. I must remain as driven as always. Crime is the way forward for the fowls. Arum est potestis. Minutes later, a greater mystery presented itself. As I washed my face at the basin, two tiny objects fell from my eyes. Close examination in the lab revealed them to be semi-corroded tinted contact lenses. Not only that, but a mirrored layer has been added behind the tinted lens. Ingenious. Undoubtedly the work of a master craftsman, but to what purpose? It is strange, but even though I have no knowledge of these lenses or how they came to be in my eyes, I feel the answer is somewhere in my own brain, hidden in the shadows. Imagine my surprise when Juliet and Butler discovered mirror lenses in their own eyes. These lenses are so clever they could have been my own invention, so obviously this unknown adversary must not be underestimated. I will track the culprit down, make no mistake. No clue will be left uninvestigated. Butler has a contact in Limerick, an expert in the field of lenses and scopes. He may recognize our intruder's handiwork. Butler is on his way there as I write. And so, a new chapter begins in the life of Artemis Fowl II. In a matter of days, my father returns with his newfound conscience. I will shortly be shipped off to boarding school, where I will have access only to a pathetic computer center and an even more pathetic laboratory. My bodyguard seems to be too old for physical tasks, and there is an unknown adversary planting strange objects on my very person. Overwhelming difficulties, you may think. An ordinary person would draw the shutters and hide from the world. But I am no ordinary person. I am Artemis Fowl, the latest in the Fowl crime dynasty, and I will not be turned from my path. I will find whoever planted those lenses, and they will pay for their presumption. And once I am rid of this nuisance, my plans will proceed unhindered. I shall unleash a crime wave the likes of which has never been seen. The world will remember the name of Artemis Fowl.